What is up? Welcome to the American Peloton. I'm Jonathan Crane. I'm a mediocre Cat 2 cyclist out of Birmingham, Alabama. And I'm Ben, head coach at Skyway Cycling and team director at Skyway, presented by Domestique Coffee. We have a really awesome guest this week, uh, Chloe Hosking. It's yeah. Awesome. Yeah, we're super psyched. We don't get to talk to, I mean, the con- conceit of the show is that we were talking about American racing. So we don't get a lot of opportunities to talk to world tour riders because it's just not uh, not generally within the scope of what we talk about. But yeah. for those of you that don't know, if you're living under a rock or something, um, Chloe has been two-time Criterium champ of Australia, U23 in 2010, and then again pro in 2020. Um, won the uh, on the Champs Elysees in 2016 on Wiggle High Five and also won the Commonwealth Games Road Race in 2018. So definitely the heaviest hitter we have ever had on this show wow. and psyched to have Absolutely. her here. But uh, what brings her here is that unfortunately her team folded. There's a great Guardian article that goes into this um, from earlier this year. I'll put the link in all of the show notes description, all that. But basically um, B&B Hotels, team folded back in 2023 one of the big i believe they were one uh one rung under world tour but they were getting wild card invites to grand tours and things like that they folded right at the beginning of the season which kind of left her in the lurch and and sucked so she had to get creative about um about her program for this year so chloe welcome to the show thanks for being on welcome hi thanks for having me it's uh really nice to join you here yeah. So off the back of that um, Guardian article, uh, you were left sort of in the lurch at the beginning of the 23 season. And um, you were you were looking you were not ready to be done with racing is sort of the central conceit of that article. And you were looking around at something to do this year. And one of the things that you did was uh, come over to America, America and race some crits. Yeah, so I had always actually started my first couple of years racing professionally, doing some of the American scene, um, where I think it was probably more heavily road race focused when I came over, but there were still a lot of crits. Um, So I would do Redlands, I did San Dimas, um, there was a crit in like St. Paul, uh, which I won. So I had like a lot of fun memories from racing in America. And I'd been playing with the idea of coming back for a while. Um, And then, yeah, everything, well, we don't really, yeah, this is it. (laughs) So I was like 19 at this, at this race. Uh, But look at the crowds. It's amazing. I I know. Yeah. So this is the Nature Valley Grand Prix that we're talking about. According to the caption on this video, that was your first pro victory. Is that, is that correct? Is this Facebook caption to be believed? It would have been my first victory with uh, what was HTC High Road. So, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, that gets into was... the fuzzy, like, what does pro mean in in road bike racing? There's, like, so many little, you're doing pro races, but you're not on a UCI team. Is that pro? Yeah, you know? yeah exactly. <laughs> um, There's that, that stratification. Yeah, I wanna because I went to Europe in uh, 2018. Uh, wait, no, not 2018, 2008, and I won a few races there, and then got signed to HTC. Um, so we came and did like racing in the states. But I obviously had this like very fond memories from racing in the states, and the the obviously the crit scene um, in Australia. We grow up racing crits, um, so I wanted to come back and. Yeah, as it all unfolded in um, 2023, it was like, well, now's my opportunity. And I think a lot of Aussies here, um, you know, how much money you can make at the Crips. Um, <laughs> right. And so I'm like, well, I don't have a job. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, my husband and I um, packed our bags and our bikes. So we launched a bike brand in in between the team folding and parting coming to America and raced on our bikes in America. So nice. Um, nice. It was great. <laughs> yeah. So a little bit of a marketing opportunity, like get the product out there. I definitely want to circle back to the the bike brand launch. But so you were you were familiar with the U.S. crit scene. One one thing we've heard a lot or like that we've theorized is like how much of the perception of the crit scene outside of America has changed in the last few years. Like 
Do you feel like more people in Australia are talking about American crits now than they were back when you were doing Nature Valley? I think that everybody knows about the US crit scene, whether it's Australia, whether it's Europe, they know what's going on. They know that there's like growing hype around it. Um, and that also goes to like the increase in accessibility of it. Like things are starting to get streamed, social media has made things a lot more present and in um, everybody's face. So, um, and obviously there's been big teams come in, like starting to really like utilize that social media to make it more um, accessible to, pe to people. Um, so yeah, absolutely was aware of it. And as I feel like US racing sort of um, went downhill a little bit and, and is now coming back up. And so as that hype was building around it, it was like, well, I've got to get there soon. I've got to get there quickly <laughs> while I can still compete. Right. Yeah. yeah so that uh, the finish of that uh, Nature Valley stage we watched, that was 2010. So that was kind of like right before the the Lance bubble burst. I think that's that's like when I was getting into riding I guess I started riding around 2010 and started really following racing within the next couple of years there. So I kind of caught like the very tail of that wave. And then for the first several years I was racing road, it was like every next year there were kind of less and less races. So I, I, def I felt that decline. But do you think um, like at, at that time back in the Lance era, like was the racing big here but no one outside knew about it because of social media like was was were people in australia like oh yeah you're going to do nature valley grand prix we know about that or were they like you're doing what they have races where yeah i think actually a bit before 2010 like in the early 2000s the racing in america was huge um and you had some really big teams and i know like actually a lot of aussie pros went and raced there and um i raced on a team like htc they had t-mobile and saturn um uh, before that and i had women that raced on those teams that i raced with and i hear the stories about them racing in america and i wish that i was racing at that time because it just sounds yeah. like it was uh, a super exciting, cool time to be around the sport. Um, and then as things do, they sort of move to Europe and the American racing petted off. But I think what is now happening really nicely in America is there's sort of been a recognition that the, the crits are the excitement, right? And that's what mm -hmm. I think Americans do really well. Like, yeah, you do bike races, but you do events and um, right. that's what a crit is. Um, yeah. So like recognizing that and building on that is, um, I, I think really differentiates what is happening in America from anywhere else. For sure. Um, so talking about crits specifically, you know, there are not that many places. It seems like US crits are big the UK, they're pretty big. And Australia is kind of like the third, you know, the podium of like places that do crits. Uh, how, how does it compare in Australia? Like, do you guys have a national series? Is anyone streaming, streaming crits over there? Is it more just like office park, kind of your local scene type stuff? Yeah, I mean, a few years ago, crits were quite big in Australia and we would have like um, a series called the Bay Criterium series, which was held like over the new year because that's summer for us. Mm -hmm. um, and they were really big, um, but it was just a five day that it went to four, three day event once a year. Um, then you'd have the national championships. Uh, but it was, wasn't like a consistent thing through the year as is um, in the States. And you would, you would have tours, so like a three or four day tour, and there'd maybe be a crit in it, but they weren't standalone events. And I do think that actually um, now in Australia, it's becoming more and more difficult to uh, run races, run road races with insurance and getting road closures. And it is, it's going to pivot to criteriums really soon because there's the recognition that they're easier to hold. Um, if you get bigger crowds, it's more accessible and it's more exciting. And I think that um, Australian cycling needs that right now. We've got a decline in membership. Um, so trying to make 
figure out what's going to bring crowds in, what's going to make people like more excited about cycling in Australia. And I think um, it's taking, looking at what the US is doing and uh, trying to implement that there. For sure. So we we yeah. talk a lot on this show about like uh, the rise of crits and the decline of road races and like our, our road races dead. It's kind of the same situation here where, it used to be that there were crits as part of stage races pretty often, but a lot of those stage races are going away. And even there used to be more like local road race stuff and that's going away. It's just harder to put on. Uh, it sounds like you see that as a good thing. I mean, not necessarily a good thing, but like, you know, making the most of the situation as it is. Um, I guess, you know, you're, you're a little bit more of a sprinter, so you're probably not longing for those like long mountain stage kind of. I'm biased. Off. Yes. I'm yeah. biased. <laughs> no, but I do think that there's a, there's a place for everything in the sport, right? Like I understand the four or five hour endurance, like road races, but I also understand that it's can be a sport that is not that accessible, not that welcoming. And, um, like it has high barrier to entries, um, whether that's fitness, whether that's cost, whether that's like accessibility and crit, Crits break down a lot of those barriers. Um, so I think that, it, like, they're an important aspect of the sport that need to be, like, fostered um, because uh, fundamentally I want cycling, more people to have access to cycling. And, uh, like, a five-hour road race is not that. It's not accessible. <laughs> so yeah, I, right. I think it's a, an important thing to um, continue growing. Yeah, it's not accessible and it's also like hard as a fan to like dedicate the time or like maybe, you know, I'll have a tour stage on in the background all day, but I'm really only tuning into like 20, 30 minutes of it when when action's happening and back and forth. And it's even as as a lot of the the other thing in America that's getting huge now is gravel. And mm -hmm. as a lot of the energy goes that way on the pro side, I wonder if we're not seeing kind of like peak gravel in these last couple of years not in terms of participation but more as like a pro sport because it's so it's not super digestible so i wonder a lot of the like money that is going that way on the pro side if they're not going to realize like we're not getting a lot out of this because it's like hard to it's hard to race there are a lot of people doing a good job of like doing those races and telling the story as a sort of like youtube kind of social media product but as the level gets higher you're not going to be able to do that like i'm i'm not that good and i'm not racing at that high of a level and there are days that i'm like i'm not making a video about this i have to just race like i don't have the bandwidth to do both yeah i, I think that like that is a part of gravel right you're not just a rider you're also like um a social media creator um mm -hmm. and that's what is great about it it's it's opening you know or lifting the curtain on what it takes to get to that level of the sport. And that's what people find really interesting. Um, so I hope it doesn't stop. I hope that they earn enough money that they can employ someone <laughs> to right. just follow them around and do sure. it. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, I, I remember, I remember back like in my era, like 2015 is when I started like getting sponsorships for mountain bikes. And even in 2015, it was what races are you winning? Oh, well I'm doing this. Okay. Well then Lauf was sending me a fork or whatever. And then, I just saw it slowly trickle in year over year over year. Well, how many Instagram followers do you have? Yeah. Do you have a yeah. YouTube channel? And now it's like for the team when I'm getting a sponsor, it's like, oh, well, your team only has this many followers. So we're only going to be able to give you X amount. So it's like, in, as you having been on teams, like what is your kind of perspective on the, the athleticism side of it versus like being at social media influencer side of it as well? I think that it definitely has a a part in some aspects, but it's no, it's definitely not uh, making or breaking people getting contracts yet. Okay. Um, so uh, where I think it really plays in is the ability of the athletes to monetize their own image. So um, if you don't have a lot of social media follow followers, it's difficult to go and get personal sponsors um or mm -hmm. even be invited to events you know like the ones the the athletes that have the 60 70 120 000 followers are the ones that are going to be um like make 
this additional money on top of their salaries. And right. you're gonna what you're gonna see is the gap actually growing between the riders mm. that are on the minimum salary that only have three thousand followers and the riders that are at the Tour de France winning stages that have 60, 70,000, like they're then getting the additional um, on top of their salaries. So, uh, yeah, it's gonna, it's an interesting dynamic um, and I think we're still seeing it unfold in front of us and athletes are definitely mindful that that is now part of their job. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting. It's an interesting like, thing that's unpl- like, yeah. unfolding. Yeah, that's something. Yeah. That's a great point, Ben. That's that's something that I hadn't like thought about in that way, but I want to connect a few dots here that I'm thinking about with like, you know, you're the first uh, pro female writer that we've had on the show. And then this is also like the first year that we've first couple of years that we're seeing like actual world tour pros uh, having these like social media presences and stuff, having like YouTube channels and, and things like that. Uh, from the perspective of this show, I wish that we saw more female pros doing the social media thing because there are a lot of races that like if there's not a live stream we can't talk about it in the way we can the men's race because there are i don't know in america probably 10 or 15 men who uh you know a snake alley criterium happens there's no stream of that but i can find five videos of the entire race and one of Mm. those guys was in the top 10 so i can kind of like see what's going on do you think that like uh it's just a numbers game that there are more people on more writers on the men's side. So more of them have social media or like it's lagging behind because the support lags behind or like, do you think there's a reason for that for, for the, the lack of uh, female writers that are like actively racing, especially in America with social media presence like that? Yeah. It's an interesting question. And I I don't know if um, like the women just, why they're not putting a GoPro on their bike. You know, it seems like a really simple thing to do. Um, While I was in the States, I definitely tried to capture as much content as possible, but I uh, just didn't buy a mount for my bike. So, (laughs) but now I regret it. You know, next year I will put a mount on my bike. Um, And so, yeah, uh, maybe it's an awareness thing for for women to to recognise that we do need to be making this accessible to then make our races more accessible. So, and that can also be, um, you know, feedback, like we could feed back to teams to say, why don't you start pushing out this content because people are interested. Um, so that's a great point that you raise and that hopefully uh, some uh, women's teams listen and like, you know what we're going to start doing? Putting um, GoPros on our bikes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We would definitely love to see more of that. I think that's the one, like, especially the the American crit racing on the women's side is like the one thing where that's, we're not already inundated. There's like a, a market niche that's not, not full there, you know, um, talking about the crits in America. So like, How different are they from Australia on a like uh, on a course design level or just like the are the roads different? I get the sense that so I'm a little bit of a like um, public space uh, nerd. I I work uh, for a nonprofit that does some bikeability, walkability, public space type stuff. So like are the courses wider or narrower in one place or significantly more technical in one or the other, or is it kind of just a a toss up between America and Australia? I think the biggest difference is uh, US crits are shorter. So I, yeah, that was when I, when I got over there, I noticed the most, like there, some are less than a kilometer long. I'm sorry. I don't do miles. (laughs) (laughs) Um, like, okay. Less than a mile long, but I think that's 1.6 kilometers. Um, so they go like, they're so quick. They're so fast. Um, I wouldn't say they're necessarily like more technical or, or wider, like in Australia, it's, it's, and the nature of crits is everything's different, right? Every, every mm-hmm. course is different, but I definitely mm-hmm. felt that overall your, your crits, uh, lent towards being shorter, which, um, was kind of exciting because, you know, it's really, it's really easy to lap the field when they're shorter. So it, it yeah. adds this added 
like dynamic to the race. Um, mm-hmm. But there was like, you know, I raced Toad, I raced Boise, I raced Salt Lake City and like I felt like the variety was really great. So um, nothing, The yeah, as I said, the biggest thing that stands out is the distance. What about the depth of field? Like, are the are the American sort of that ACC level? You mentioned um, uh, Salt Lake is an ACC race. A couple of ra- races you mentioned are are ACC, which I would consider to be the top level in America. Um, is is the depth of field here greater, or is it? You know, it's just as hard in Australia, but there's just not as many people making a living at it or making money at it. Or how how would you say the level is comparatively? Yeah, I would start with saying, so I raced a few ACC races while I was over there and then like non-ACC races. Mm -hmm. And they're just between those two in America, there's a, there's a difference because obviously the teams come, they're chasing the points um, in the ACC races. So that was definitely the highest level. Obviously it's your highest um, level of race. Um, And with Australia, it's a similar thing, like depending on the importance of the race, the field changes. So our our national championships is stacked. You know, you've got all the pros, they're all there and we care. Um, It's not like it's uh, just a a side race to our road race. No, no. Like Mm -hmm. if we win that national jersey, we really care. So everybody's there and everybody's racing. But then if you do a criterion, uh, for example, like one of the stages of the Bay Bay, Bay Criterion Classic, um the level is lower so i would say it's pretty com- comparable uh, also with field numbers um between america and australia so uh probably a few years ago in australia the fields were much bigger um but i think people are starting to get more serious and um doing less crits because their focus is on going to europe in march and april and not racing crits in january um so which i think is quite a shame because there's so much value in racing crits you know it it teaches you bunch positioning it teaches you skills it um so i i hope more people come back to it (laughs) yeah do you think that's maybe um you know we're seeing especially this last year we've seen a lot of riders like come from world tour yourself included to race grits in america for various reasons some of them signed to ncl teams uh there there was more opportunity to like make a living or make a salary i guess doing uh american criteriums i guess without like a national series that's probably not as much the case in australia is that true yeah no with australia if you want to like make any money you need to leave um (laughs) so our talent just doesn't stay here it's just not sustainable um which is like really disappointing for australia but then they come to places like america and um i think that's just the nature of of the sport and um yeah it's also i enjoyed my time in america so i would i would expect more people to go (laughs) right yeah, I guess that's an easier jump than Europe. I mean, one thing we always hear about American riders uh, maybe underperforming in Europe or or whatever, feeling like they, they're underperforming is it's just a tough, you're probably going into a team that like doesn't majority speak English all the time. And you're, I mean, just things like you're living in a country where you don't know how to get your power turned on. And like, yeah. there's just a lot of like cultural stuff outside of the, the racing itself but going australia to america a little bit easier of a, of a jump yeah Cult- absolutely culture. and i like whenever i speak to young riders they they always want to go to europe you know they see the world tour races they want to race the world tour races and i often encourage them to start in america first um y- y- there's like you know the races are more accessible you're exactly what you're saying you're in a country where the culture change is not so abrupt um mm-hmm. and what is really important for young riders is to learn to win not to learn how to not finish races um so and i feel really fortunate that that's how my career started was racing in america um and doing these races that i wasn't against you know the world champion the olympic champion but i had the opportunity to really like get my elbows out and sprint for a finish line 
um, mm -hmm. and that's uh, like invaluable for a sprinter at a young age, like learning how to, how to be, you know, sprinting for lines, um, rather than just trying to finish races. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Um, I would love to, you, you know, you're talking about kind of learning tactics and that side of it. I would love to like drill down on the, the tactics and criteriums and kind of how you think they're being raced now. Has that changed over the course of your career? You got like a glimpse into what was going on in America 10 years ago and then what's going on in America now. So yeah, just what are your thoughts on like where crits are at right now? I think so for, from my experience from coming to race earlier this year, I was there in June and July, um, was it's difficult when there's one really dominating team. Like it, it makes the race very one dimensional and there's not much the other riders can do. Um, so that sort of saps a lot of the, the tactics out of it because what can you do? Mm -hmm. Um, but then when I went, for example, when that, um, ACC races, I was racing, then more teams came in and it like, it opened up the tactics. Um, mm -hmm. so, uh, that, that's obviously a, a positive when there's more teams racing that are more capable of like actually impacting the race. Um, but I was still able to have some fun when, uh, there, there weren't so many teams around cause you can sort of, um, you know, I went chasing, pr uh, sprint frames, <laughs> yeah. which was great. And I, I, I learned pretty quickly that sometimes they ring the bell for like the bunch and not the people up the front. So I'd be like, well, what's the point of me going off the front? I can just right. sit in the bunch. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> and, um, so I think that like, yeah, there's the tactics that come out with teams and then there's the individual tactics that riders can play themselves. And I do think that it's really important for riders to experiment with tactics because that's how you learn to win. Um, if you just keep doing the same thing over and over and over and coming second, third, fourth, what's the point? Um, you've yeah. got to mix it up. And that was something when I was in the States, like I wasn't there just to, um, you know, ignore everyone else and do my own thing. I was, I really wanted to meet as many people as possible, have as many conversations as possible. And part of that was speaking with, to the women I was racing with and being like, oh, maybe you could consider doing this next time. Um, you know, I have 13 year professional um, career. I, I do have like a certain insight that I, I'm happy to share with young up and coming women to try and grow the sport. And it was even small things like, thinking about the line you're taking through a corner and um, things like this. But I'm also mindful that I don't want to come in as patronizing or condescending. Like um, I just, uh, if anybody wants help, I'm happy to, to give it. So I don't know if I answered your question though. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think so. I think, I think you answered it uh, and, and more maybe. Um, so like one comparison, I think it's so hard to get away from, uh how racing in america compares to the world tour and you're in a really unique uh position there are not a ton of people who have raced at the current sort of acc level and also in the world tour so recently and uh i think one of the things we hear all the time is like you know these american racers they they wouldn't they would get blown out of the water in in the world tour and like uh that the level is just so different so like how both in terms of like the level of fitness but also in terms of like tactically how different is the last five laps of an acc race from like maybe not the champs elysees finish since that's like <laughs> kind of the top but like you know you're the finish of scale de Prus or something yeah, I mean, I think it's really good that you made that distinction between the last five laps, right? Because I think the hardest thing comparing American crit racing and world tour racing is they're totally different things. Um, like world tour racing is a four or five hour endurance race. Mm -hmm. Like crit racing is a sprint. Um, yeah. And I do think that if some of the world tour riders came to America to race, they'd be like, what is going on? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm meant to have three yeah. hours to warm up and yeah. then I will sprint. <laughs> yeah, we saw that. Uh, ben and I were at um, 
Speed Week, I guess it was Athens Twilight maybe two years ago, and the team from Columbia, yeah. the Medellin team with like Oscar Sevilla and Superman Lopez is on it now. But the first year they came over and did that, I got the sense that like the races would start so hard because it's only an hour. I guess those are like an hour 15 or something. But yeah, you know, they they were not concerned with getting clipped in very quickly. And like half their team is out the back in the first 10 laps, like pulled behind the motorbike. They're done. And I could see them like, what is what's going on? Like they just were not. <laughs> it's a different yeah, thing. Like, it's much more similar to cyclocross racing um, where it's just full gas from the gun. Um, and that is just not what world tour racing is. But then if we, if we fast forward to the sprints, um, it, it is quite similar in that you've got the trains lining up. It's like, it's really fast and it's all about position and it, it's the same thing, copy paste, right? The, the difference is, um, with world tour racing, the, the bunches are bigger um there's more teams competing and um you also get the and I guess one similarity is in the states you sort of have the superiority of the teams and it's the same in the world tour um it's very hard for an up-and-coming sprinter to to cut through because uh you've you've got to earn your spot there at the front of the Mm -hmm. peloton um so you see young sprinters crash so often because first of all their their assessment of risk is lower um and they're putting themselves in more dangerous positions to be in a position to win um so i don't think that the sprints are actually that dissimilar it's just that the lead up to it is so different and um i think that american like crit races have a very unique skill set and i think that world tour races have a very unique skill set set because i know personally like sprinting after an hour and 15 minutes is very different to sprinting after three hours and 30 minutes um so they're almost different athletes it's really like track and road um track and crits so and i think that's you see uh a couple of years ago the australian women's crit uh national sorry track team would come and race in America and do very well because it is, that is so similar. Yeah, that makes sense. So kind of speaking on that last bit where you're talking about how criteriums and world tour, they're so different. They're almost polarized, right? Um, you going from the world tour and then you grew up racing crits, but and then coming back into racing crits, was there a bit of an adjustment period or did it just feel like coming home? Um, yeah, I wouldn't say there was an adjustment period. I was just uh, less fit <laughs> because I had to. Um, I learned very quickly that, uh, and I think I uh, learned a lot of admiration for people that try to balance a job and racing uh, because I've been in a really fortunate position that since I was 18, all I've had to do is ride, is race my bike. Um, and I think that throughout my career, I've raced against women that have had to juggle things and I haven't fully appreciated how difficult it is. <laughs> welcome. Um, welcome to this side. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, welcome to the team. <laughs> so, um, and I will be honest, I did not do the transition very well because, um, I came to America and I, I wasn't as fit as I would have liked to have been to race those, those crits. Um, but I was still like, you know, my race smarts uh, kept me, I was able to still compete. So right. uh, when I come back next year, I'll make sure I train harder. <laughs> nice. Did, did you awesome. change up uh, for this year or will you change up for, for the next time you're here, next time you're doing crits, uh, like the training in terms of like, you know, less five hour rides, more like 30 thirties. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's a mistake I made in that, I tried to keep a lot of the volume in my training coming to America, which I just didn't need. I should have been doing like more intense, um, yeah, like 30, 30s exactly, um, shorter, shorter rides. I really didn't need anything over two hours, but just super high intensity. Um, and actually yeah. that's a more, um, you know, that sort of training fits better when you're trying to work alongside. 
Um, mm-hmm. So right. definitely I, I was, I've been able to learn a few things from my time in the States this year <laughs> that I will be able to implement coming over next year. So hopefully I finish on the podium in one, uh, well, on the top of the podium in one race at Toad and a few uh, like just second and thirds in other races. Um, so hopefully a few more first places next year. <laughs> Nice. Yeah. I, nice. you know, I didn't expect to circle back to this at all, but it, it makes me think like thinking about the, like the gravel race versus cyclocross even, and like the rise of crits from a, from a, uh, not a spectator perspective, but a participant perspective. It's a lot easier to be fit for, I mean, I'm saying this for myself also, it's a lot easier to be fit for crits and cyclocross because you yeah. can, you know, I, I can do an hour two hours of hard intervals after work on a nine to five day, but I can't, you know, be really good for a, I don't know, 12 hour, uh, gravel excursion type race. Like you can't just can't do that as much as an amateur. So. Yeah. And it's very different training, isn't it? So, um, and I think that the training for crits is more enjoyable. Same. It's for for whatever reason, like mentally, it's easier for me to go just smash myself for an hour than it is to ride sort of hard for four hours a couple of times yeah. in the week. That's yeah. just me personally, but that uh, it makes me wish more people were racing cyclocross. I'm I'm getting hyped for my first cross race next week. So everybody go race cross. Just it's fun. <laughs> um, cross will make you a better bike racer a hundred percent of the time. For every discipline, especially crits, I think if you race yeah. across all all winter and then you go do crits, like you, you'll kind of be on easy mode if you've never done that before. Like it, yeah, you get those those repeated hard efforts and you get used to that that style or whatever. Um, so you mentioned like the the pecking order of the teams and how that's similar in the World Tour versus in America, which leads me to. We got to talk about Legion. Um, you mentioned that you had some some thoughts on uh, on what's going on with them having raced against them, and they're obviously highest in the pecking order with Kendall Ryan, the Schneider sisters, a ton of wins in the last couple of seasons uh, on the women's side specifically. So yeah, how what are your thoughts on that after having actually like been in these races and seen how they're how they're racing them? Yeah, I mean. <laughs> I I was disappointed, to be honest. So I, when Legion burst onto the scene in what, when was it 2018 or 2019 around that time, I was really exciting, uh, excited. I thought this is like exactly what the sports needs. Um, yeah, it's going to diversity. It's going to inclusion. It's trying to make the sport more accessible, or, or at least this is what was coming across on social media from Australia. And I was like, you know, I was a hype woman. I I would share all their stuff, or not all, but some. And uh, when the Legion's Den um, event came up, I was like, yeah, I'll come to that. And I was really at, like, my peak, um, uh, like, winning big World Tour races and was, like, open to coming to, I think it was in Sacramento or something like this, the race. Yeah. And I was like, I'm going to come over and do this race to support, um, uh, like, what is a really exciting thing coming into the sport. Um, I didn't go. <laughs> I don't know why. I think I was on holiday somewhere um, in, in off season. Um, and then I came to America and I was like to, to race and I see them sort of parked up in a corner away from everyone. And I was like, where's this um, like accessibility how are you like making yourself more available to everybody at the race to like build the world like how welcoming cycling is and I didn't see it at all and then in the race is the same thing like the riders really try and intimidate you um when you do something a similar move that they would do they yell at you and they say you don't know how to ride a bike and I'm like "Mm, no I do know how to ride a bike (laughs) um so I, I think it's really disappointing that there is a, a team that has so much potential and present a certain image and then they're not delivering on that image. And, um, you know, I've been a person that uh, throughout my career I've been very outspoken, but I think I live my values um, and I hope that Legion can um, maybe uh, take a do a bit of an assessment 
and um, improve that. And, it, you know, it'll, it'll you saw it a lot, actually, when I was in the States, the, um, the national champion criterion um, happened. And Corinne Rivera just had a great race. You know, she just outsmarted Legion and won the race fair and square. And then the behavior of some of the Legion riders after that was really disappointing. And I think when you're positioning a team to be encouraging more people to get into the sport, it doesn't matter what the result is, you need to be a good sport and you need to, um, yeah, represent your sponsors and yourself well. And that's being, um, yeah, being able to admit when you got beaten by a better rider and then taking what, what happened in that race and learning from it. And then sharing those lessons with everybody you're racing against because um, you should be trying to bring everybody up with you. And that's not what I found when I was racing with legions in, um, in America. Yeah. So that, that's like validating for me in a lot of ways. I want to get, I want to really drill down on the specifics because the, the extreme minutia is what we love to get into on this show. <laughs> so like in the closing laps and the women's squad of Legion races it a little bit different than the men's. Uh, I've got a video on this YouTube channel somewhere about how Legion men's team that year that they really won everything. They were the full race they would sit on the front like a sprint train and they would rotate two riders basically to set pace if someone got up the road a breakaway got up the road they would start incorporating a third rider into that rotation and they have you know ty magner sam boardman on the men's side some of the strongest diesel engines that can sit there and do that on the women's side they tend to kind of like sit back a little bit and wait for something to happen they don't sit on the front for that full race in the same way but where it does become similar, it seems like, and tell me if this was your experience, is when it gets into the finale, into the last, whatever, 10 laps, where they decide to really take the front and take charge. And on the women's side, they're fighting DNA a little bit, has like a full sprint train. There are a couple other teams that have full sprint trains that also want the same thing they do. But they, uh, more so than than any other team, take every turn to the absolute curb on either side in a way where like they will not let you ride alongside even if you have the legs to do so you're going to the curb they're going to swing every curb on the outside apex on the inside curb on the outside every single turn and you're going to get pinched back behind legion your only options are to get ahead of them off the front and then you're stuck in the wind probably solo or you're pinched off behind them and you're in that scrum fighting, but you can't ride alongside. And from what I see, you know, we get the helicopter shots in the world tour races. It does seem like there's a little bit more. Um, if your train has the legs to ride alongside my train, that just happens. Is yeah. that true? In, in Europe or mm -hmm. in America? I guess both. I, like it's true that that happens in Europe and it's not happening in America. Yeah, I mean, in Europe, for sure, like, if you can ride next to the train, you ride next to the train, and there's no one trying to come into your line or, or anything like this. It's um, it's a bit fairer in that aspect, whereas um, I did find racing in the States, um, it's, uh, it's like intimidation tactics are really ripe um, and sort of borders on bullying, to be honest, which is disappointing. Um, if you win, you should win fairly. If you, if you can't win fairly, you shouldn't win. Um, and I think that you do see, particularly in the women's, there's not the depth there yet for teams, um, mm -hmm. when you don't have Miami Knights, Denver Disruptors and Legion there, like, uh, I think it will come. Um, but right now, yeah, even if you're an individual rider and you try to challenge, um, the, some of the tactics that are being used are not fair. Um, and it's, it's disappointing to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It seems like that, that's a point that I've made many times. And a lot of, uh, I mean, YouTube comments are like the worst thing ever in, in both directions. Like I can't uh, wait to see the YouTube comments. <laughs> <laughs> Don't try not to look at them, but we definitely get a lot of like, things yeah at the end of an episode is like seeing the comments and seeing if people think i'm stupid or not that's yeah like one of my favorite things to do yeah me and it's ben not personal have... but i'll mute them <laughs> yeah. 
We we definitely have a good time sending them back and forth. But we hear a lot of like, we well, all don't know you're not world tour because we've talked a lot about Legion taking taking everyone to the curb and not letting anyone ride next to them, even when there are, you know, on the men's side and with the NCL teams this last year, we've seen uh, more more teams that are potentially. I wouldn't say on the same level. I think Legion is still probably head and shoulders stronger um, above all those teams. More teams that, if they time their move right and they they play it smart, could ride alongside for three, four laps, and they're just not being allowed to do so. And people saying, like, well, the World Tour is way more hectic and it's way more crazy and cutthroat. And, like, I'm I'm an outsider, so I'm I'm looking at those helicopter shots, but that's not what it looks like to me. So that's definitely uh it's good to have a world tour rider uh validate that perspective yeah yeah and i mean like i've watched the video of justin basically just turn right and Mm -hmm. like that's not normal so um so you don't think that happens in the world tour Um, like if if you if someone you know if uh if a team is setting up their sprint train, you're coming into the last couple of corners, another team rides alongside. Team A is not going to send one guy to take team B to the, into the barricades, essentially. No, no. Yeah, that seemed there beyond the go. pale to me. But yeah, that's yeah. pretty cut and dry. Um, I had another uh, Legion related question, but I I mentioned NCL. Maybe we'll come back to it. So. Uh, you said that you had some thoughts on NCL and its impact on ACC, Toad, all that stuff. I would love to get your perspective on all of that. Yeah, I mean, I think, like, the starting point is they've erected two new teams. So that's a great thing, right? And you, I saw it in the ACC races where Miami Knights came and showed up and, like, they were a strong team and they did change the, the dynamics of the race. Um so, and I know there's definitely been some teething issues from the NCL, like you've seen it um, unfold over the media um, or through social media now with a bunch of their riders being um, laid off. Um, I think with any new startup, which it, it, it is, there's going to be issues um, and it's now going to be up to the riders whether or not they take that risk of joining a new organisation which is, um, it's a shame because it would be great if they could attract, you know, the best talent, but um, writers talk. (laughs) So we'll see what happens. But then at the end of the day, they are offering money and that's, um, if we can get more writers that are getting paid, that's going to lift the level of the sport. So um, it will be interesting to see how their next year goes. Um, And... uh, I do agree that something needs to be shaken up in cycling to bring more money in um, and to make it a more like an entertainment focused um, event that you can sell to Mm -hmm. consumers. And that's what they're trying to do. So I don't have the answers. It will be, um, I'm looking forward to seeing what their next um, iteration of it is. So that's the kind of like nuanced take that is going to make the whole internet mad because you're going to get people that are from the NCL side being like, that's not positive enough. We need you to be all in on loving the NCL. And then you're going to get people on the other side that are like, NCL is a joke and you're an idiot for even thinking. So that's exactly like on this show, you're fitting in perfectly because we're, we're trying to like, (laughs) you know, credit where credit is due, but also call out the things that are goofy and, I've learned that that just makes everyone mad. The internet is yeah. uh, exclusively, exclusively wants like the hottest takes in the most the most extreme in either direction. Mm. So, yeah. Uh, to drill I think down, like one of the things that frustrates me the most about cycling is that um, we'll do what we've always done because it's what we've always done, and mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah, but it, for so many people, it's not working. Yeah. Um, yeah. So why wouldn't we try something new? So, sure. um, yep. and y- of course, if you try something new, it might not work, but then mm-hmm. you just keep like remodeling it, rebuilding it, seeing, seeing what does work. So, yeah. um, yeah. and obviously from like a female cyclist point of view, I'm all for changes being made because for so long, um, 
there hasn't been enough done in our space. And so that, you know, they've immediately brought in equality um, is really important. And I love that they're really combining the two teams. They're creating an environment where it's not dog eat dog. It's um, we're all in it together. And I think that that's a really important thing to bring to cycling um, because the athletes need to know that together they're powerful and it's not just um, like we're individuals that can be trampled on. And I think like probably my experience at the beginning of the year is coming to um, is like shining through here because I felt like the athletes were so isolated that nobody had any power and so yeah. uh, what the ncl is doing is creating a league where the athletes can have some power yeah i i will say like uh on the the leap to connect that to the legion thing like in giving credit where credit is due they definitely started a high level women's program in, in an environment where like not a lot of teams were doing that especially the high level us crit teams that were around at the time it was like very uncommon to have men's and women's teams under the same banner, but now yeah. like, they've done it. They've also started their subsidiary teams, which I have like issues with, with the structure of that for the time being, but credit where credit is due. They started women's teams with both the aviators and the blazers. And, and now it's more common. I mean, no, absolutely. Butcher box automatic, like everyone has been pushed to that. So like full credit to Legion yeah. on that. Front. Yeah. And, and what Legion do do really well is they promote their athletes, which goes exactly to what we were speaking earlier in that that's where real, where athletes are going to be able to monetize their cycling career. You know, you get a salary. It's not necessarily the biggest salary, but then you can go out and through the brand you've built, um, make like monetize your image. And that's what Legion yeah. ha does do really well for their athletes. Um, yeah. Uh, so, and I guess what, one of the reasons why I was so excited about them as a team when they burst onto the scene was because they were immediate, like, we're here for equality, we're here for inclusion, we're here for diversity. Um, and these are all things that are so important to me. Um, so, and I think that they can, they can definitely achieve these things. They just maybe need to. <laughs> right. Um, Same. Like I got really excited I, in the same boat. Like when Legion came out, I um, I guess I kind of came into the sport. I kind of backed into it. I started commuting. Uh, I got a fixed gear. I started doing alley cats. I started, you know, kind of like stair step my way into it. But coming from that sort of like fixed gear boom era where everything was like very cool, and then getting into road cycling where it was like at the time, if the team had a had a social media account of any time, it was just it was just like pictures of guys in the team polo like it was very like robotic and weird and not cool at all so when legion came out and was just like here are writers and they are cool people and they have individual personalities i was like finally this is like yeah it's so obvious that someone should be doing this and yeah absolutely and, and also being intentional about like we're bringing people of other races into the sport we're bringing we're fully supporting our female writers it was like so obvious there was so much more like um diversity in the fixed gear kind of like side at that time it was so like obvious that there was huge room for growth so like credit to them and also to ask you an actual question about that would you say that like in australia people are if you're aware of american crits it is like legion is the one team you know is that true of most just random people yeah, in australia basically I, I don't know if many people know of any of the other teams. So I think that the, the like the NCL people are starting to pay a little bit of attention to that. So then obviously like the teams that are attached to that are starting to be known. Um, but as more Australian riders uh, get picked up in these teams, that's the easiest way to build the awareness, you know, right. like um, we love our riders. We follow our riders. Um, as soon as they go to a team, you're going to bring a bunch of Australians um, into following that. And I think that's something that is, you know, uh, is unique to sport and unique to cycling. Like you, a lot of the the fans move with the riders. 
Um, so uh, it will be great to get more Australians onto these teams over there and tap into that Australian market. Um, so sign Aussies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. so in the uh, 2024 season, you've mentioned coming back to America. Do you have anything like in stone yet or are you – you're still working uh, on the schedule or what? Well, to be honest, uh, we didn't really have a schedule uh, when we came over right. this year. It was like, oh, I guess these races are on. We found out that Gastown was on uh, while we were there and was like, should we do it? Yeah. <laughs> um, we didn't do it. Um, but for, I would for sure do Toad. I really enjoyed Toad. I think that they put on an incredible event. Um, and I just loved that it's such a party. Um, yeah. which is exactly what I want from my cycling right now. You know, I had mm -hmm. so many years of being so serious to the point where you almost start hating the sport. Um, and what coming to race in America did was reinvigorate my love for it. Um, so I'm really grateful and thankful to, um, the races there. So, um, I think that what we'll end up doing is probably everybody, um, you know, talks about Tulsa tough and that I have to, I have to do Tulsa Tough. So start, mm -hmm. start my season, crit season with Tulsa Tough and go all the way through until Intelligentsia. Um, so that's getting a huge chunk of racing. Um, obviously, uh, I'll be racing on my Hosking. So what we loved about the racing in the States was it was, we were able to have so many good conversations, get our bikes in front of people. And um, that's exactly what we'll, we'll be trying to do again next year. Awesome. Well, if you're awesome. looking for like a tune up before Tulsa, I highly recommend Speed Week here in the southeastern okay. United States. We got yep. Athens Twilight. Um, Sunny King is normally before that, but Athens is definitely on that tier of like Tulsa tough party race. It's in a college town. It's like I, I feel like it was four deep along the barriers for my race, you know, two hours before the pros or whatever this year so okay yeah. sold sold i'll yeah. see you there <laughs> highly recommend no, i think that um now that you uh said that it's a party scene i'll be hard pressed not to go because that's something so i went to america with my husband and i would always i i'd do the race and then go find him somewhere along the barriers and i roll in and i'd be like how many beers deep are you <laughs> <laughs> so, so he um so, and that's also the great thing about like racing in the crit uh, the crits in america like it's so much like it's so spectator friendly um mm -hmm. you know jack my husband would come and like follow races in europe and they were almost just impossible to follow um i'd be like yeah. see you in five hours and he'd have mm -hmm. to get 140 k <laughs> yeah, so a hundred right. miles somewhere else. And I'd be like, have fun finding your way there. Whereas <laughs> he really enjoyed um, following the racing in the States and um, just being able to have a good time. So, yeah. 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 At, we, we did uh, Athens Twilight this year, our team, Ben and I, and Ben and the guys were posted up on the, on the barricades uh, with some beers and they were directly across the street from the Georgia theater. And, um, so I did our race, hung out with them, went to the Georgia Theater and saw uh, George Clanton, uh, kind of lo-fi internet, but like saw, like watched a concert, turned around and came out of the concert. And I'm seeing like lap number five of the women's race. Yeah. And like Ben and the yeah. guys are there cracking beers. It's like, <laughs> you know. Yeah. It, it's so it's, good. It's a celebration yeah, it of cycling. Which yeah, for sure. Yeah, it almost doesn't get better than Athens. Like Tulsa is really cool, but Athens is like, they call it the Super Bowl for a reason. Okay. So okay. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, there's more planning. I need to do more planning. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. So I want to bookend it. We you mentioned the bike brand up top. So you started an entire bike brand like in the midst of this. Uh, the bikes look awesome. Tell me a little bit about uh, your goals with that and like where where that's going. Yeah. So um, there's not many women involved in the uh, bike manufacturing bike brand industry and um uh I, like I obviously come with the bike background the bike brain and my husband comes from a startup background so we had this conversation for a while about how this was something that was missing from the industry that we could offer to the industry um and so when everything started to unravel we're like am I allowed to swear I don't know. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Go for it. <laughs> we were like, fuck it. Let's do it. 
Um, <laughs> so we went down a rabbit hole and, um, yeah, actually really proud with what, what we've um, come out of the rabbit hole with, which is um, an, an aero sprint bike. Obviously, it wouldn't have made any sense to not do that coming from my right. end. And we've got a carbon model, but also an al an alloy model, which for me is really um, the bike that I want to push because it's accessible. You know, the price comes that. down, but also racing mm -hmm. in the States in crits. Um, my very, very first race that I did, there was a crash and two bikes broke in that crash. Two carbon frames were just, you know, sent to the garage, never to be ridden again. And uh, like alloy bikes make so much sense for racing in crits. You know, you scale them with really great components, you scale them with really great wheels and the weight doesn't matter in a crit. Um, not that even yeah. at my size anyway, the bikes already un would be underweight. Um, <laughs> so uh, we've got that um, bike, uh, which will be available by the end of this year. We might even have some American crit teams racing on them next year, which is pretty awesome. exciting. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. And then um, we've got our all roads bike, which is essentially a uh, performance road frame, but with wider clearance. Um, so you can have like the flexibility of putting a gravel wheel in there or a road wheel in there and racing it on gravel or an, in, a, in a crit. And um, the idea behind that bike was not me wanting to make cycling more accessible knowing the barrier to entry and that not everybody can have two three four bikes um it's a if you need if you can only have one bike this is the bike to have um and that That's will awesome. come in an alloy and a carbon frame as well so um but the the brand is about um making bringing cycling to more people and it's you know it's not about racing at the world tour it's about enjoying riding your bike. And if you want to race, you can. Um, that's awesome. Yeah. I, so I'm I love really proud about it. It um, takes up a lot of our time, obviously. Yeah. Um, sure. But it's also like invigorating. And I do feel like I'm very grateful and indebted to cycling, what it's given me, what I've gotten out of it. Um, and if I can give something back, then um, that's really important to me. Um, it's yeah. Uh, as an athlete, you you can be very selfish. You have to be very selfish to get to the level. Yeah. And um, now it's about giving back to my sport. That's that's so that's awesome. awesome. I love that you're talking about. We have talked about alloy bikes on this channel many times. Uh, I, our team is mostly either on a team bike that we get a good discount on, or we're on alloy crit bikes. Or you know, you have one of each, and we're racing the alloy bikes and crits. But yeah, I think there are like four cads uh floating around in, on our team and i i'm At racing a cad four. 13 right now and I, I am always saying that like there's a reason there's the uh your lay is overpriced is like a meme there's a reason that's a meme and it's because like a lot of people want a cheap bike they can race like a, a bike that's not going to be a hindrance it's a decent weight it's decently aero it'll you know it's race geometry and uh, that's why there's a gigantic resale market for that. And I feel like the fact that companies, the big companies are leaving a lot of money on the table. And frankly, I've said this on the channel a lot too. They're leaving people out where right now you can be like, oh, we're going to focus on our premium product and shift everything that direction. You can probably do that and get an immediate return right now. But what you're missing is in five years and 10 years, a lot of those people who maybe would have gotten into racing and their first bike would have been that entry level aluminum model race focused. And that's what they would have raced on for their first couple of years. Those are the people that are going to buy the expensive thing in five ten, And yeah. you're, you're just not going to have them. They're just going to yeah. walk into a bike shop and go, I'm not going to try it out on a $5,000 bike. Like that's insane. No, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And with crits, you know, it's one crash and your bike is done. So, and especially when you're getting into the sport, that's not what you need. And I, I work a lot with mm -hmm. juniors and it's the same thing. They grow super quickly. They crash a lot. Um, you, you, as a parent, as, as someone helping a kid get into sport, you need to make sure that their bike is going to last. Um, and so, yeah, our, um, uh, our probably our two mottos for, for Hosking Bikes is um, we want to make world-class bikes accessible 
and we will never sell a black bike. So <laughs> if you see any of our cool. bikes, their yeah. paint jobs are loud. Um, yeah, they're they're, they're they there cool. to be noticed. They're there to start a conversation yeah. and they're there to bring the fun back to cycling. Um, so yeah, that's they, they look that's awesome. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I lo would love to see one of those aluminum bikes once they come around. Um, we're, we're running out of time on my yeah. stream yard recording. So no, uh, I'm sorry. I talk a lot. <laughs> uh, yeah. Us too. No. This is a, this is on the yeah. short side for our episodes, which is good. The short ones do better. Um, yeah, but, uh, where can people find you? Uh, where can we see, you know, you're, you're going to get a GoPro mount. Where can we find that stuff? Yeah, so we have um, hoskingbikes.com is our website. Um, we've got a landing page there at the moment uh, before we go live. And then I'll be, I'm on social media. So Chloe underscore Hosking on Instagram, on um, Twitter. Um, and we do have also a YouTube channel that we're building. Um, so we're, we're easy to find. We're, look, we're, we also want to be accessible so if anybody wants to chat to us like just slide into my dms <laughs> or um or uh, our dms again hosking bikes is on um twitter and instagram so um yeah we're we we text back <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah i can awesome. uh, i can confirm that that's true that's how we ended up here um awesome well it's been great to have you uh Looking forward to seeing you hopefully in the States, definitely racing somewhere next season. And uh, yeah, at yeah. Athens, I'll, I'll roll up on my <laughs> alloy bike so you can check it out. Awesome. Yeah. Perfect. That sounds great. I'll see you there. All right. Thanks no, for great. being here. Thanks for having me, guys. It was really nice to chat. You too. Peace.